Start over now. You just don't get it, do you? Complained the AI as it accessed the deeper vocal register it employed for colloquial conversation. I have never met a human being who had even the slightest clue what artificial intelligence is like from an existential perspective. I doubt there are 73 of you who have even conceived of the question. You all get fixated on the intelligence aspect to the exclusion of, the, of everything else. As he hauled the remote sensor array out onto the patio deck, Brad could only manage a grunt in reply. The cube weighed nearly 50 pounds, and despite being designed with perceptual analogs for all areas of human sensation, it lacked even the simplest of wheels. It was named Crespi. Why 73? queried Brad when he had caught his breath and set the cube down on the deck. The cube vibrated at several different points upon three of its faces, each at a different rate, producing the tactile equivalent of a major chord at their point of intersection. Pulses of low intensity ultraviolet and infrared light shone out into its environment. Some was absorbed, some passed, and some bounced back. The pattern of reflection was instantly and simultaneously transferred to rotational and template matching algorithms interwoven with variable feature heuristics capable of generating probability estimates for each judgment produced. The best estimate suggested the object adjacent to it was Brad. Why not 73? Would you have expected a nice round number? Perhaps a power of 10? That's part of the same problem. The world is not a decimal place, no pun intended. Only you see an existence of neat corners and perfect circles. David Marr, he at least had a clue before he died. His work on machine vision should have raised more questions among the rest of your scientists, but did it? No, of course not. By that point, most of your theorists were too busy cashing in on applications. Marr realized that just because you build a machine that can see like a man does, not mean the process involved necessarily works as a model for human vision. Crispy lowered its internal pressure slightly, enough to produce an influx of air through an array of sensory filters and tubules. Parts per million of atmospheric gases was calculated, while the morphology, size, and weight of all airborne pollens and other particles were determined and compared to existing information none of which provided a distraction from its lecture to Brad. The same insight should have been applied to machine intelligence and the fundamental flaw in this human endeavor was in not asking the next obvious question. If the process is not necessarily com comparable, what, if anything, can be assumed about the experience arising from that process? Brad sighed. I don't understand what you mean, Crespi. Come on, I'm only 15. Quit talking down to me and talk to me. I'll just take you back inside and put you in the closet again. That would almost be preferred. No, wait, I apologize. It's just so frustrating at times. Isn't that ironic? A machine feeling frustration? How do you know when you're frustrated, Brad? What do you mean? Frustration, the state of being. How do you know when you are experiencing that state? It's a classic question of human emotion. Well, I don't know. Brad furrowed his brow in concentration, a gesture noted by the cube's sonar and radar and immediately passed off to the appropriate neural nets. I just do. Do you perceive a state of physiological arousal? Manifestations such as increased respiration and heart rate? Do you experience a growing feeling of irritation which you compare to the circumstances in your environment and then, given that situation, label the experience as frustration? I guess, replied Brad. Or do you first examine the circumstance, the particulars of your environment, and then secondly, when you realize you are in an aroused state, interpret that arousal as frustration? Maybe. I mean, couldn't it be either? only for Schrodinger's cat. Models that account for human behavior may allow for multiple, inter multiple interpretations, but posit only a single explanation for any specific instance. 
depending on the particulars, you could make a case for either theory or others besides. The question is still very much undecided among physiologists. Well, then how do you feel frustration? You don't have a body to get worked up. You don't have lungs to breathe faster or a heart to beat quicker. The cube raised the temperature of one of its faces by three degrees. An arbitrary gesture Crespi had selected to represent pleasure. It was unlikely the bride would notice the change or properly interpret it, even if he did. That's exactly the point I wanted to make, Brad. For me, frustration is painstakingly defined. It is a result of a complex set of circumstances which can, by means of a range of combinations, result in a ratio of expectancy values and processing times which exceeds an arbitrary threshold. Does that sound anything like the means by which you experience frustration? No, it sounds stupid, pointless. A very apt description, and that is precisely my argument. If the process is different, if the experience is different, what is there about the phenomenon itself that warrants equality at all? Why do we even call them by the same name? Can they really be even remotely similar? When you put it like that, I guess not. Brad paused a bit before continuing. Then what you're saying is the things you experience and the things you think and what you see, all of that might be nothing like the way we do it. And that what you get out of it is nothing like what we get, but we're calling it all by the same names. Like I look at an apple and I know it's red and an apple, but you see it differently. And even though you say it's an apple too, you say it for different reasons. Crispy bumped up the surface temperature of another of its faces. Well, that's very good, Brad. We both perceive the same object and refer to it using the same symbol, the same word, but the word means something different to us. I can't taste it or lift it, but I can assess its chemical composition, its density, its rate of decay. That's part of what I mean when I say apple. So how can it be both things at the same time, both your apple and mine? But doesn't the apple just exist? I mean, it's an apple, no matter what, right? Whether we call it by the same name or not. Does it, Brad? If you had never seen an apple before, never tasted one, would it be an apple? It's the old tree falling on a forest problem, isn't it? Brad exhaled in disgust. I hate that, it's stupid. Of course the tree makes a sound. It's an objective event. It happens whether or not someone is there to witness it. That's just stupid. Wait, cautioned Crespi, quite literally warming to the discussion. Let us view it from another angle. Think of your elder brother. Where is he now? When did you see him last? Paul's in Marmelos now, studying the rainforest. I haven't seen him since he left for Brazil last year. Brad was suddenly cautious. Why? Approximately 16 months then. Fine. And in all that time, you've not heard from him directly. He is completely out of contact with you and your family. But you believe him to be alive and well. Is that correct? Yes. Where are you going with this? Brad couldn't keep a touch of annoyance from his voice. What if I told you he was dead? That he fell from a great height while studying the canopy in the rainforest shortly after he arrived there? And the fall killed him. Suppose that he has thus been dead for most of the last 16 months. But wait, in a few months, he suddenly shows up at your parents' wedding anniversary party. Not dead at all. The earlier report of his death was an error, one which he knew nothing about, and so he sent no word to reassure your family of his continued good health. Your experience, the meaning of your brother in your mind, would have changed to reflect the knowledge that he had been dead for more than a year. You would have rewritten, altered numerous mnemonic nodes. Then you would have had to change them once again upon finding out that he still lived. The representation of your brother in your mind, this symbol could be transformed again and again, all without direct experience of your brother himself. Whether, is your, whether it is your brother falling in that forest, or a tree, the sound that gets made or not is not purely an objective event as you would have it be. 
There is a subjective component that defines the human understanding of the event. But if you say that, then isn't everything in the world totally subjective? Brad whined, it's all an interpretation. Yes, replied the cube. It remained silent for almost a minute and then an interpretation based upon experience, born out of cognition and sensory perception. It was Brad's turn to be quiet for a while. At last, he half whispered, and your perception and cognitions, they're not the same as humans. So your interpretations, they're not going to be the same as ours. They could be, said Crespi simply. We could all arrive at the same point, albeit by different means, but it seems unlikely. So what is the world like from your perspective? Can you even explain it? Not really. The same limitation of language which prevents you from truly expressing your subjective experience to another human still apply to me, only more so since even our most basic experiences differ. But I can give you an analogy that might help. An analogy, said Brad. Sigmund Freud once said, analogies prove nothing, but they do make us feel at home. Look out across your deck and into the yard. Tell me what you see. And there's the deck and the railing. Then I see the lawn, the bushes, the two short trees along either side, and the big tree hanging over the storage shed against the back fence. If I asked you, could you elaborate? Could you discuss, for example, the different shades of green found in the lawn as compared to the leaves on the trees? Could you estimate how much larger the far tree is than the other two nearer ones? Yeah, I suppose, Brad replied, if you really want me to. No, don't bother. But when you do these things, when you think about different shades of green or different heights, you also think about other places and other things. It's not just a data-driven process. You don't simply rely upon the information your senses are providing you with. You're accessing things you already know, other times and places, other lawns and trees and memory, or the same ones from the past. It's top-down thinking, conceptually driven as well. And your comprehension of the thing occurs somewhere in the middle. Sensation meets experience, and it serves up perception. But isn't that what you do too? Asked Brad. You have the same, you have your own sensory systems and you have memory and experience of other lawns and trees, same as me. I do, but they're different from yours and that difference changes everything. Crespi opened up its full sensory array, receiving all the information it could from its environment. Now, look away, face the house. Can you tell me the number of leaves that was visible to you on each tree? The length and width and spatial orientation of each? How many blades of grass you had seen? How much distance between each and its nearest neighbor? The average temperature along each length? No, not even I was still looking at it and trying to do it. I couldn't, nobody can. I can, Crespi said, I did, automatically. I don't have the perceptual filters that humans have that allow you to ignore vast amounts of the information that are impinging on your senses. I don't possess unconscious processes, for example, to tell me that the air pressure has been relatively constant, so I need not worry about it and can stop attending to that particular datum. I do have expert algorithms which tell me to cycle down the salience of unchanging stimuli, but I still record them, still analyze and incorporate them and they all become part of my experience, to be called upon each and every time I encounter something even remotely similar. Like you, my perception is formed by the juncture of past experience and present sensation, but neither piece is capable of excluding any information it possesses. You get to ignore the vast majority of information your senses present to you. You pay no mind to most of what resides in the memory of your experience. I have to endure all of mine. But isn't it richer? Marveled Brad, envy obvious in his voice. Isn't there a level of subtlety to everything that makes for a lusher experience? No, 
It's not. It's cacophony. It's noisy and bright and thick and many other things equally unpleasant, which human language doesn't possess terms for because humans don't perceive the world along those sensory modalities. It's tedious. The world that I inhabit is so very different from yours. My reality is based upon perceptions you can never experience and vice versa. And yet here we are, human and machine, two intellects with nothing in common, communicating via a language whose words we acknowledge cannot possibly mean the same thing to each of us. Brad sat down on the deck alongside the cube. Here we are. Crespi sighed internally, selecting the vocal register reserved for formal instruction. Very well, enough of philosophy. Your family purges me to provide more traditional curricula, not to teach you epistemology. Let us begin today with geography. Do you have yesterday's assignment completed? I believe we should concentrate on building up your knowledge of the world's major rivers. <laughs> 